as they were acquiring different companies, what they found is they had a lot of inconsistencies in the way in which they were doing business. So what they wanted to do was improve their business functionality for future scalability and growth. So what they did is they said, okay, across these divisions and, and uh, these, these brands, we have this inconsistent experience. Some are doing better than others. Let's centralize. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I am Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. Not many businesses understand how to capitalize on these strategies of truly globally integrated organizations. They struggle to bring all the departments together from one plant. Bringing together all the entities and sites in one system is much harder left than you would think. Sometimes you may be lucky to be forced into it as your customers might be requesting centralized order processing or consolidated invoicing. And then you might be distributing them from locations most financially feasible for your supply chain. Centralized order entry requires you to share your master data across entities with deep intercompany and intersite functionality. And if you also have challenges such as omni-channel or complex e-commerce architecture. It could be even more complex. So what are the differences between centralized and decentralized order processing? In today's episode, we invited a panel of cross-functional experts for a live interview on LinkedIn who brings significant expertise to discuss the pros and cons of centralized versus decentralized order entry best practices. We covered many grounds, including what centralization and decentralization mean in different industries and how these businesses might be able to take advantages of synergies offered by these strategies. Finally, we discussed several stories where centralization and decentralization strategies resulted in financial and customer experience efficiencies. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you're joining for the first time, this is part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one topic related to digital transformation and we always have a very exciting panel that is willing to share their insights. For today, we have a very interesting topic that can go in many different perspectives. So we are talking about the centralized order processing or decentralized order processing. We'll find out what that means uh, once we dig into the topic. Before we do that, we are going to start with everybody's intro. And uh, I'm going to start with my intro. If you don't know me, I am Sam Gupta. I am uh, principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the um, uh, independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm. We help our clients uh, with ERP selection, implementation, etc. On that note, I am going to move to Chris, Chris Garadini for his intro. Thanks, Sam. Hi, Chris Garadini, president and owner of Turnkey Technologies. Uh, we're a 28-year-old uh, Microsoft Dynamics ERP implementation. So look forward to the conversation today. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Abu, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Sure. Uh, my, hello, everyone. My name is Abu. Uh, I'm the founder uh, and owner for Pani Management Tech Corp. We are a Sage XC partner. We've been in business for about 15 years now. And we serve a wide variety of industries from food manufacturing to chemicals and equipment. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Abu. Uh, Christina, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Absolutely. Hi, Sam. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with all you guys. Uh, Chris Harrington, president of Gen Alpha Technologies. We are a digital commerce SaaS software company for OEMs and aftermarket organizations. We really just help them with their digital commerce journey, which typically starts at e-commerce and then advances from there. E-catalogs, RMA warranty, and product configuration. So 
Uh, looking forward to this topic. Thanks, Sam. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Christina. Uh, Tom, thanks for joining. Can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Yes, happy to do so. Can you hear me all right, Sam? Yes. Apologies to all of your no. fellow panelists and any guests for my tardiness. Uh, I am Tom Rodden. I am a former CIO at Varian Medical Systems and now serving as a consultant uh, for ERP programs. And it was working on one of those programs that caused me to be late here today. So again, apologies and looking forward to this topic. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Tom. And if you are in the audience and joining for the first time, make sure you guys uh, comment and send your questions. We typically try to cover them during the show. If you cannot get to them because of time, I'll Panelists are going to make sure that you guys are going to receive your answers. So I am going to start with the first question for today with Chris uh, Garadini. And that is going to be, when we look at the centralized versus decentralized, it could mean a lot of different things. In the ERP world, that has a different meaning. E-commerce world, slightly different meaning. But at the end of the day, you are trying to find some sort of synergies because the order processing may be closer to one location and then you want to uh, you know process at different systems or different locations so when you think of the centralized versus decentralized order processing uh, what would you say and why that is going to be important for the executives to know as they are structuring their organization Chris, over to you Sure. And, you know, as, as I heard the topic and I'm thinking centralized and you're thinking call center constant, right? Where, OK, hey, all the orders are coming into a call center. And I'm thinking, who makes phone calls anymore? So, again, I'm not going to pick too much on the centralized being a legacy perception, but I really do believe that decentralized is a world we live in. And, you know, as you think about the architecture and what that means and organizations and they may start centralized and maybe, hey, I got a bunch of clerks or I've got my team keying in all the orders, right? Customers are, they're capturing them and the, and the team keys them in. But there's an evolution where we really want to capture orders at the point that they're created. And I think that there's a, there's a labor efficiency, you know, there's just a, a customer experience that you create where people buy more, they shop more. So, you know, old, I'd say call center, centralized, it's kind of old school um, from my perspective. And I've just seen the, the industry evolve. And I mean, there's a lot to that though, when you've got to deploy and you're thinking about these peripheral points of captures. How do I allow people to put an order in and have it show up and be good, right? Do they know what kind of stock? Do they know that I even got that product? I mean, is everything a back order because they don't know anything? So there could be a lot of complications with that peripheral experience. But if it's done correctly, meaning you've got a lot of integration loops that's moving, you know, visibility of data, visibility of stock out. So generally, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the decentralized model. And if I listed, if you think about a customer portal, an e-com site, a retailer that's sending you an order through an EDI, uh, a guy that's got an app that he can order off of an app. I mean, there's so many peripheral ways to capture an order, right? So it could be something that's an intercompany where somebody creates a PO and it automatically creates a sales order to ship to fulfill an intercompany transaction. So a lot of different examples of, as I'm going to call it, peripherally created transactions. And again, I don't think that anybody can say, oh, no, 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 they all got to come right here. You may start there, but there's absolutely an evolution to be part of. Okay, amazing okay. insights there, uh, and thank you so much for uh, you know painting the the picture there. Uh, obviously, it has a lot of different layers overall. The way you are going to think about the centralized order processing versus decentralized order processing, and one aspect is definitely going to be slightly more multi-channel the way you described, and then you have a little bit of omni-channel aspect there as well. But you know, let's say if you look at more from the ERP perspective. Typically, and, and I am talking more from the supply chain efficiency perspective or from the financial efficiency perspective, the centralized order processing is going to be slightly more ap applicable in your multi-site structure where you are trying to process the order for another site. Maybe you have four or five different sites, and I don't know how applicable that is going to be in different industries. I have seen some scenarios where companies really want to capitalize on that to take advantage of the, the supply chain uh, you know, efficiency. Different, different term. Let's talk about fulfillment, decentralized fulfillment versus order yeah. capture. So maybe use the wrong terminology to address what you're really asking about. Because decentralized fulfillment is great. I'm capturing orders and now I'm pushing them out to distribution centers based on geos and so forth. So distribu distributed fulfillment or decentralized fulfillment is just a different concept. But that has a number of different strategies as well. Because what are you doing? You're Now you're capitalizing on geographical efficiencies and proximity to customers. I mean, you look at the Amazon distribution centers. No, they don't. Nobody 
nobody nobody's going to fulfill out of a single warehouse unless you're a small company. But as you get into the larger scale, you know, distributor decentralized distribution is pretty common. And people do that based on geographies and in shipping. Again, if you think about volumetric products, I've got people that do pharmaceutical bottles. Well, they have to build those pretty close because you're shipping air. Right. So there's a great example where I need a plant in East Asia, one in Europe, one couple in the U.S. And those are examples where you have to be decentralized just of the types of products. So product dimensions, products could lend into, again, decentralized fulfillment or not. So I think two topics there, decentralized order capture, order entry, as you called it, versus fulfillment. So a couple of topics. Yeah, I completely agree. And thanks for pointing that out. Uh, and obviously, it could go many different ways. And that's why it's very important to understand, you know, how everybody thinks about these things. Uh, so, you know, we were definitely thinking about the order processing. Now, order processing could be just the capture, or it could include the distribution and fulfillment as well. So thank you so much uh, for clarifying that, Chris. No problem. Um, now, Abu, I'm actually going to move to you. So maybe you can tell us, uh, you know, what you were thinking when you think about the centralized versus decentralized. Have you seen any sort of best practices or the challenges when companies try to capitalize on that? Number one, have you ever seen anybody using the centralized versus decentralized? And if yes, then what were their gains? So, I mean, so today, it's, you know, you have so many different channels to sell, right? So previously, you could have a call center and, you know, you can route out orders to there or you could just have your own one website. But now, for example, if you're selling through Amazon, right? So you have your own, uh, you know, it's a different ordering system. It's hard to integrate those systems with, you know, ERP uh, available right now. Then even other large retailers, for example, Best Buy, the big electronics retailer here in Canada, they have made their website a marketplace, right? So again, uh, you know, you can sell your own products through Best Buy. And then, you know, so you're getting orders from there as well. Um, So now, you know, then you have other large retailers who are doing the same. So, you know, the key question becomes, you're getting these orders from all of these different places. Yep. How do you consolidate them in one system and then also push out, uh, you know, to your, to your fulfillment centers? One of the key challenges, you know, that happens with these is when the customer orders, I have seen companies facing, they cannot fulfill the order. You know, I've, you know, I've run across clients where get, they're getting all these orders from their different channels and that they had to let go of 50% of the orders because they didn't have the inventory to fulfill. How do we accurately push out the inventory figures to these all these different channels? I had a you know, large client, a large retailer based in Canada where we did this large e-commerce implementation. They would say that you know if they have 100 in stock, that means they're out of stock. So they would start, you know, they'll put a stop on it, fulfilling those orders. And especially again with a large retailer, we had a horror story where they updated a flag saying that the inventory is all sold, but in actually they had a whole warehouse full of it, right? Because one of their fulfillment center, uh, you know, their their messaging system screwed it up. And now, so it's a very complex topic in today's world. Um, you know, it really depends on the kind of industry you are in, how you are selling. And, you know, and then how do you fulfill, right? So gathering all that is just one part of the story. It's also, if you have it in one place, you know, if you're collecting all the orders now, how do you push it out for fulfillment? You know, that also becomes a key issue. Yeah, so very interesting commentary there. And uh, obviously it's becoming even more challenging as the channels are increasing. And you are absolutely right. I have personally seen crazy scenarios with the inventory as well. And the the funniest inventory for me is always going to be fake inventory, uh, you know, because why would you have fake inventory? <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's very common, especially when you look at the e-commerce, because the integration becomes so challenging that you know companies cannot really afford to yeah. have the live inventory, so they are simply going to have the yeah. fake. And it's inventory. not just one e-commerce website you're integrating to. You know, you have Amazon, you have AliExpress, you have multinational you know, websites where you can place your orders from. It makes it very, very complex. Yeah, I completely agree. So when you look at the consolidation, so are we talking about the consolidation of the single order or are we talking about consolidation of different orders? Because you know these two are very different things, right? So when you talk about the, let's say, if the consolidation is coming from the same, where you need to, let's say, ship the good from many different locations, that would fall under more of the you know, you get the centralized order from the headquarter and then you are shipping it to five, five different locations because they might have five different locations. So that's a very different deal and very different business process than simply uh, capturing the orders and serving it in, in from the central place. So are you attacking more from the uh, the single order perspective or multiple orders? I think both of them count, right? So it's how do you consolidate all those orders into your, you know, into your ERP system now? 
right? And then once it's all consolidated, how do you fulfill those? So it can be fulfillment at an order level, or it can be fulfillment at an order line level. And then you can add complexity on top, you know, people due to various financial reasons may have structured it as a multi-company environment, uh, right? So these products are only ordering from this company, uh, and, you know, we are going to fulfill these orders from, you know, our subsidiary B, and then how do you do all those intercompany order processing and then fulfill the customer at the end of the day, right? So, you know, that's where the challenge comes in. That's where, you know, how do you manage it? How do you distribute it out? How do you sequence it, right? So the order has come in, you know, it's in Calgary, for example, here in Canada, how do you find the closest shipping location, right? To yep. minimize your freight costs, for example, right? So that becomes another challenge uh, as well. So, you know, so you have to look at your business model, factor all of that in, and, you know, companies keep on, Optim working on it and optimizing it forever, right? As the business changes, you have to continuously look at the process to keep on optimizing it. Okay, amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Abu, for that. So, Chris, I'm actually coming to you. So, uh, you know, from your perspective, when you thought of this topic, what were you thinking, you know, uh, and have you seen any sort of centralized, decentralized order processing? And, uh, you know, what would be your commentary on this? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sam. I, I guess the first thing that I thought of was back in my manufacturing days, right? We, we had a corporate office here in the United States where we uh, manufactured our large equipment and products. And uh, we were a single company with a single product line that we were trying to distribute and sell throughout the world, right? So we had our subsidiaries who were located in multiple countries uh, throughout the world. And they manage their own order entry processes with the customers. But we were all on a single ERP system, right? So you have the single ERP system taking these orders in. But the order entry personnel are located in the various countries to meet the need, the language requirements, and other things. So you're centralized in the country to support that country and culture and language that you're trying to do business in. Uh, and you may have a central warehouse in that country that is talking back and forth uh, to your to your corporate office. You're getting you're driving strategy at the corporate and pushing out to the subsidiaries. So there is this decentralized approach to how you deliver information to your customers and speed to the customers. And then the order entry into the business is through those subsidiaries. But then it's all consolidated through that single ERP system for full delivery uh, from corporate. So that that's how I originally thought about it. And then the story that you know I I have an experience with in recent years is that we were working with a PE firm who had purchased multiple brands, multiple organizations, and they were and and. As they were acquiring different companies, what they found is they had a lot of inconsistencies in the way in which they were doing business. So what they wanted to do was improve their business functionality for future scalability and growth. So what they did is they said, okay, across these divisions and, and uh, these, these brands, we have this inconsistent experience. Some are doing better than others. Let's centralize our customer service department and that order entry so that we are delivering a consistent experience to our customers. We have single processes. We have more control over uh, hiring for the talent, uh, building our processes and making sure that we're delivering to the customer what we're, what, what we're hoping to deliver and, and that consistent uh, process is met. Um, I think decentralization and centralization really comes down to what your goals are as an organization and, and where you need improvements for growth. Um, so there can be, you know, some certainly value in centralizing, and then there could be some real value in decentralizing. It depends on what your challenges are and where your opportunities are with the business. You know, I, I was uh, thinking about something that I had heard recently that I found really interesting is that, you know, as companies, we are always trying to be more efficient in the sales process. And I consider order entry part of that sales process, right? It's, it, uh, it is that experience with the customer. You're taking orders from your customers. So we're always trying to build these uh, efficiencies and gain some efficiencies what we forget is we're not creating an effective 
buyer process to ensure that we're actually meeting our buyer's expectation. So I think uh, as you start to think about all the different ways that you create a more effective buying experience, which then you can leverage to increase sales, uh, that takes us into these more uh, e-commerce type channels, omni-channel approaches, and uh, you know where it can even get more complicated and complex as you think about centralization and decentralization. So I have seen certainly the corporate structure with subsidiaries, you're getting close to customers, you, you have the flexibility and agility um, to meet needs, but you still have one consolidated ERP system taking all that data versus a company who has disparate processes, multiple locations, trying to consolidate into one consistent process to better uh, leverage their, their new business, their new strategy, and deliver better for customers. So I think there's two ways to, to kind of look at it, Sam. Yeah, so very interesting perspective there and very interesting story, by the way. I, I really like the, the P story. So in that story, let's say if I am looking at this, so you mentioned that, you know what, you are centralizing the whole customer experience piece. So are we talking about more of the customer 360? Is that what are we trying to centralize? Or uh, is, this the, is this going to be, can this site process the order for the other site? Because this, these two are going to be two different things. So uh, did they do the customer 360 or the order processing from multiple sites for other sites? So what they did is they they centralized the order processing. So all of the communication with the customer and taking orders. So they, they also launched an e-commerce site. I will say it was two parts. They centralized yeah. their call center and they rolled out an e-commerce site. So customers had the ability to self-service or call into a call center but the distribution, so the fulfillment and the production of the goods was still happening at the multiple locations. So they centralized the customer piece, the order entry piece, but any questions related to the product, and this is where it gets challenging, right? So if those customer service people aren't in the location where the manufacturing or the fulfillment is taking place, they might not have uh, the knowledge uh, or either the knowledge of the product or the knowledge and experience with the customer. That's something you lose when you centralize, right? But uh, they were able to scale and grow as they acquired more companies. They were consolidating and through this uh, smaller group, they were able to, again, use their consistent processes and people to apply that to more businesses. Okay, amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Chris, for that. So Tom, I'm coming to you, and I know that we were having this uh, discussion last night, and we knew that this discussion could go either ways. Uh, so I know that we were thinking more from the ERP perspective uh, that, okay, uh, you know, decentralization and centralization could a lot of different things. So from your perspective, how would you break it down uh, for the people who might not be familiar with, you know, how this is gonna work? Sure. I, I agree with pretty much everything I heard from the panel. You always assemble a good panel, Sam, and uh, they're, they're, we never come to fisticuffs. We tend to have uh, consensus. But uh, it's interesting. I, I looked at this, as you were saying, when we chatted briefly last night, I was looking at this as systems and operations. Um, and I tend to lean towards more centralized systems. Um, but not necessarily centralized operations. And I think this is part of the point that Chris was making, that you can have a single ERP or you can have a, a global uh, e-commerce system. And that does not necessarily mean that you have centralized operations. Um, in fact, that may be a real enabler to making decentralized operations work properly um, and not lead to a lot of problems uh, with the decentralized approach. So I think there's a there's an important distinction to be made between the system and the actual operations, um, whether that's people in call centers, whether that's the sales team, whether that's uh, customer service admin, whether that's even the logistics side of things. Um, but I know this was more focused from the question on order processing. So focusing on that. Um, you know, I, I look at those as the two key parameters, systems versus people process. Um, now, one of the things I thought was interesting as I listened to the rest of the members of the panel um, was that some people, you know, people talked a lot about centralized systems. Um, 
and, and Abu talked about e-commerce and, and Chris talked a bit more about ERP. And, and it occurred to me that um, centralized and simple are not necessarily the same thing. So you could have multiple global systems that require complex integrations and it's centralized in the sense that there's only one ERP and there's only one portal and one e-commerce site and there's only one of this and one of that, but centralized doesn't necessarily mean simple. So again, uh, centralized to me means more global, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean simple. Now, when we were, when I was thinking about this, and again, like a lot of my colleagues here, um, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer uh, on the operations side. I tend to believe there's a right or wrong answer on the IT side uh, that you want centralized um, uh, for a lot of reasons, and that decentralized systems tend to lead to a lot of challenges. And again, I'm making a distinction between decentralized systems and a you know the, the simple versus complex landscape. Again, you can have centralized systems. And you may choose to have a number of different components that you integrate, but it's still operating on a truly global basis. Um, but to have decentralized systems where I'm running different ERPs, if you will, different e-commerce solutions in different geographies, to me, is likely to become a problem pretty quickly. Um, so, so, again, I, I think that's a critical distinction. I can have many different call centers around the world. Uh, I can have many different sales organizations addressing time zone issues, as Chris said, language issues, familiar with local regulations, local customer customs, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that can work decentralized while our systems are fundamentally centralized. Um, and I think that's typically what we see, in fact, in global companies. You'll see the operations to a significant degree being somewhat decentralized, at least distributed, let's say. Um, there may be a clear organizational hierarchy that at some point is centralizing, it, but they're distributed and, um, and, and the systems tend to be truly centralized. And, I, and as I thought about this, I went through a lot of different pros and cons. For, you know, if there's no right or wrong answer for the operations to be centralized or decentralized, you know, what, what's the driver for that? And again, without taking up, you know, the entire hour we've got, you know, but there, there are real drivers for um, being centralized or decentralized, right? And again, a couple of people brought up customers. You know, are you really a single uh, country type of operation? You're selling concrete. You're probably not shipping it around the world. Uh, and so you're probably got a pretty local market. Um, you may be able to do everything uh, in a, a fairly simple, centralized manner, um, uh, even from an operations point of view. Um, but if you are selling something that is much easier to distribute, where you have uh, uh, the potential to uh, increase revenue and profit margins and so on um, around the world, then you're going to probably end up with a fairly distributed set of operations. Um, and even even I've always talking about you know, the logistics may, may drive you in that direction. Y you may not have full alignment with the rest of the business. But to me, that's that's another factor to think about. Do you want, do you need alignment? It's one thing to have centralized order processing. And then, you know, you may have decentralized uh, distribution. You may have decentralized sales because it's more important that the salespeople, if you want to think of them not as order processing, not as hands on keyboards working in systems, but they're really just the face to the customer helping to make the sale. But ultimately, they're giving it to a back office to load into the system. You know, you could have a centralized uh, order processing team that's separate from a decentralized sales and service organization. I've seen that too. So anyway, I, I think there's there's a lot where you have to think through uh, what's necessary in terms of organizational alignment and what's not. Um, so um, it, it may be very useful to have uh, centralized teams like order processing from a training point of view, uh, from a uh, agility point of view, when we do make changes to our business processes and to our system, how quickly can that be absorbed and, and flawlessly implemented? Um, and if you have many, many distributed operations, people um, and sites around the world, you're certainly going to increase the likelihood that it's going to be uh, absorbed and implemented 
uh, with varying degrees of success, um, at least initially when you, when you introduce change. So again, if you're in a very dynamic world, that centralization may pay huge dividends. If you're in a fairly stable industry, change is not as rapid, um, then you may not need to have, or you may not have the same risk uh, with a, a more decentralized set of operations. So anyway, those are just some of the thoughts that were running through my head, Sam. Very, very interesting commentary. And I definitely want some more colors there overall with respect to the change. And I don't know how many listeners are really able to follow along how change is going to impact the decision about centralization versus decentralization. Do you want to paint some more colors there? Sure. Yeah. I, I, I mean, try to be brief. Um, so I worked in the medical device industry for yeah. many years and it heavily FDA regulated, uh, controlled uh, to the point where change, but there was constant change, but it was uh, probably slower than in many industries in terms of not idea generation, um, but actual implementation. Um, and so just releasing new features, uh, new products into the price book um, was a quarterly, sometimes annual affair, um, as opposed to other business models where, you know, it's, it's a daily affair. Um, so the, the speed of change in our industry, um, I think, helped to allow uh, more decentralization where there was time for change to be absorbed, for it to be implemented effectively. Um, and you wouldn't have chaos because, you know, you had 100 changes coming at uh, order management teams distributed across 50 countries. And, you know, you're going to have to translate things and have, conduct all this training and so on and so forth. So the ability to uh, uh, manage change to me is also a key factor in whether or not you want to be centralized or decentralized from an operations okay, Amazing. Again, Thank one you. factor. Thank you so much, uh, Tom, for that. So, Chris, I'm actually coming back to you, uh, and we are going to be covering some stories. If you have any specific stories where you have seen decentralization being more common, and if you have seen any sort of financial supply chain, any sort of, you know, customer experience efficiencies, uh, you know, because of centralization versus decentralization, do you have any stories that you might? Yeah, and I'm, I just want to start off because as I listen, I think that the segmentation of the process can can go from decentralized to centralized back to decentralized. And specifically, as you know, Chris's point was great. As you think about control and so forth, but if we think about order capture, and we I said in fulfillment, but if you think about order capture, it could be all over the place, great. But once yeah. we get it, once it lands in one ERP, no, I don't want a bunch of decentralized ERPs in one ERP, but they have centralized customer service, right? The order lands, someone's got to pick it up, okay. Does it automatically fly out to the distribution centers or somebody controlling that? But even after it goes out and it could be dispersed into decentralized fulfillment centers, but it's going to come back around and ride centralized invoicing, AR cash payment. So I think that as people hear this, that there are some areas where, hey, let's take orders from everywhere. Right. They all got to land in the same place, but then we manage them in a consistent process, ship them from wherever you want. And again, it comes back. So there are some centralized processes there. Um, and again, you go back to the to the stories and again, the, the complex architecture. And again, the simplest example I actually talked to with somebody today is um, is where they're pushing out a power app to a distributor. So now we're really decentralized order capture where they give the guy a device. And on this power app, it's a power BI chart that shows that his inventory loads and he clicks on it and it creates a sales order in the back office system. There's a great example. Example, people are like really simple, very low impact on licensing. We create a customer experience. We push that out there. So that's that's the extreme on the other end. But as you go back to the disties and we go back to the other side of the equation, where the fulfillment, right? I may have centralized order processing, meaning I'm capturing, I'm managing, I'm releasing. But maybe I'm using a 3PL. 3PL is a perfect example of decentralized distribution aspect of your business because you're, you're getting rid of it. Could be you have a warehouse, you use another warehouse. But again, that model, and I've got customers that have both 3PLs and they have their own warehouses. So again, decentralized on the distribution side, they do have centralized order, pro centralized meaning customer service. And I'll use that term because once the order is booked, one team handles it. But again, the dispersion, they're gathering orders from EDI, from e-commerce, reps in the field via CRM, right? And again, you get it, maybe some auto replenishment. But those are the, those, that's the one example I have. I'm not going to name the company, but nice architecture, it really was. And they did have decentralized, centralized, decentralized. Okay, a lot amazing, of possibilities. Amazing insights there. And Chris, uh, I'm going to have a follow-up question for you. Sure. And that's going to be on around my favorite topic and your favorite topic, which is going to be architecture always, right? So now when we think about the system implementation, right? So from the system implementation perspective, 
I don't know how many people can think of decentralized versus decentralized, how to plan for that and how to make decisions which is going to provide you decentralized experience. The decentralized experience, there, are, there could be several different layers in terms of how you want to plan for it. You know, which are the entities are going to be holding the product, what product data is going to be shared, what customer data is going to be shared, what vendor data is going to be shared. And all of the, the points that you mentioned, you have to implement in a way so that you get the results that you are looking for. When you talk about, okay, centralized versus decentralized order capture, and then centralized versus decentralized distribution, and then finally the invoicing. So all of these things are going to have multiple layers and you need the information architected in a way so that you can accomplish what you are looking for. So how do you plan for this architecture when you are thinking well, from business? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, you know, when somebody shows up and they have a project, do they already have that complexity in their world or is it the future? And or do you find them halfway in between? And I think a lot of times what's the current landscape and is this is this the perspective that okay we're going to grow we're going to get real big and everybody does but meaning is that an incremental rollout and an extension into the decentralized mode and certainly you know everybody that's selling they're always okay do i light up every channel to sell and they're like scared right well what if i get a lot of orders and so even that process is going to be what i would describe as incremental so again if I show up and they've already got the complexity, I've got to replace it. I can't really deprecate any of it. But a lot of times we show up and, and they're still on the cusp of expanding in that. And again, as we look at the Omni channel, it's a next and next and next. And people are typically adding these channels as they feel confident and they can manage it. But again, to your point, there's a lot of integration, meaning if you let people take orders and you don't have any of the inventory stock visibility, you can have a cluster and you can have just crash because of customer service. So that's why that incremental strategy is behooves companies because they don't overcommit, but they also really get their ducks in a row because you're right. If you're not in that mode today, great. You crawl into it and you plan, okay, where's my best ROI? When do I open up this channel versus this channel? How do I control it? I've got a group that, that only put 10 products out there. They got hundreds of SKUs. Let's start with 10. Let's see how we do with 10. And so there is a crawl, walk, run, even in getting to the decentralized order capture. And again, even what do they give customer devices? They're going to make sure they're doing it right internally before you extend that out, because there's a lot of business logic and processes you got to put in place to make sure that if I'm capturing a transaction out here, it's perfect when it gets here. And even that, it may be gated. So a lot of considerations just on that front end order capture before you extend it out. And certainly the backside distribution, as I said, a lot of companies may have already evolved in that model. They may have three warehouses when you're showing up, and they may already be doing that because of the size or the weight of their products. And they know that I can't ship from the East Coast to the West Coast, I need to have a DC out there. So a lot of them have already evolved that. But if they're growing, certainly, you know, they buy a system and the platform, you've got to know that it has that capability to extend to multi-site, multi-location. And when you're doing your master planning, your MRP, that it's got transfer in, transfer out, as opposed to some mindset that everything goes one way. Because And it needs to support those complexities so that you can scale into that. So there are requirements. You may not be doing it today, but you need to make sure your systems do have the capability to kind of handle those capabilities as you go there. So. Okay, amazing insight there. Thank you so much, Chris, for that. So, Abu, I'm actually coming to you. And, uh, you know, when I go to the businesses, obviously centralizing is not something that I personally see. Okay, even inside just one site, one plant, uh, they are probably going to be using multiple systems. Let's say if they are doing manufacturing and distribution, okay, they are probably going to have two different systems, one for manufacturing and one for distribution. When we talk about the consolidation of global footprint, multiple entities, multiple sites, that's a very, very, very complex, uh, you know, implementation. And sometimes people simply avoid getting into that because it's just too much thinking that, okay, I need to figure out, okay, how am I sharing my product data? How am I sharing my customer data? How am I sharing, sharing my vendor data? Let's just keep them isolated. So in your experience, when you look at this, how would you plan and what would you advise when you are going for that are thinking of going for the centralization journey? So, so there are two aspects to this, right? So one is how defining your own business, right? Yeah. So if I say you just you should only centralize or decentralize, you know, that will be the wrong answer, right? It's not going to work in every, every time, right? So the key thing to figure out first is what's your sales strategy, right? So if you're a if you're focused towards consumer items, right, then you're probably going to have multiple channels to sell. So you have to be on Walmart, you have to be on Amazon, you have to be on, you know, other large retailers, you have to have your own website. Uh, you know, you may also have your own other selling partners. So that's going to, you know, so you'll have a distributed ordering system, right? So you, you have to then figure out how we to consolidate those orders and then fulfill it. If you are, for example, a B2B customer, you are making large engineering products, you know, you can say heat exchangers or things like that. 
where it's not like a consumer, you're not going to get hundred orders a day. It's a million dollar item, you know, it takes four months to sell it. Then you can have a, it's easier to have a one centralized system to fulfill it, right? So geography is not important because all your manufacturing is going to be concentrated in one place. All your distribution is probably going to be happening from one place rather than having six different distribution centers across the country and then fulfilling it from there. So that would be the first thing, you know, I'd ask businesses to look at is what's their sales strategy, where they're going with it, what's their long, like five-term vision, and then designing the processes to support it. I mean, ideally, you'd like to have at least one ERP system managing all your aspects of inventory. Uh, you know, if you have too many systems, then obviously it becomes a big challenge, you know, just to have visibility across inventory. But, you know, again, it depends on, you know, what kind of product you're selling, right? So, so a lot of these companies, like somebody talked about a private equity firm here, they could be in two fundamentally different markets, right? They could be selling shampoos and also food products, right? So how do you combine those two systems together? And then, you know, how do you have one ERP system which is focused with the food industry and also perhaps, uh, you know, a hard food consumable industry? So, so it's all those challenges and figuring it out that is going to define the ERP implementation plan, the systems plan, and how to go about it, right? So if you have if you have one product or you do not have a lot of different kind of products, then it's easier to have one centralized system. That's what we should go for, uh, and that's what you should plan for. But if you have if you have you know products that do not really complementary products, you know they have very different production requirements, they have very different you know distribution requirements, then it's probably to have systems which you know which can handle those unique business needs and then consolidating it perhaps at a higher level, integrating at a, a different kind of level to fulfill those orders. Uh, you know, so then integration becomes a lot more important than perhaps you know, having one system. Okay, amazing. Do you have any specific story that you might be able to share uh, where you have seen any sort of centralization where that gained some sort of efficiency? So, I mean, so for example, we work with a large, you know, retailer uh, here in Canada. Again, you know, they would sell equipment, you know, they'd be procuring, you know, food, you know, they'd also be selling uh, lawnmowers. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll also be selling TVs as well, right? So very different kind of system, very different uh, procurement requirements and very different storage requirements, right? You have to, you know, you know, have to worry about expiry dates when it comes to food, but you don't have to worry about expiry dates when it comes to lawnmowers, for example, right? So those systems, you know, where it becomes complicated, I mean, what they would, uh, they did was they would have centralize all the orders and then they'll figure out what how to fulfill it right at a centralized level you would have different ERP systems running in all of their different uh, facilities and then that centralized system would have a logic layer built into it you know if it's a food product for example uh, you know based on for example postal codes uh, geography we are going to push it this order for fulfillment to this system right and that's how the, you know they'd be managing it they'd have an order and a fulfillment management and then you know, and keep your ERP inventory management system. But obviously then you have to make sure that they're talking with each other, they are in sync. And then again, depending on the kind of sale you're doing, you either have to have runtime integration or, you know, it may be, you know, enough that you're doing a batch, you know, overnight processes, right? Again, transaction volume comes into play, right? If you're a large retailer, then you have thousands of transactions a day, it becomes difficult. If you are a smaller, more custom product seller, then, you know, you have only a few transactions, you know, then maybe even a manual process may work. So again, it really depends on each business, where they are situated, what kind of products they're selling, what is their product miss, and so on, and then defining the appropriate strategy. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Abu, for that. So, Chris, I'm actually coming to you. And uh, as you know, I mean, we are in the ERP business and there is a lot of uncertainty and I am thinking to diversify it and trying to sell, you know, maybe burgers uh, alongside that, which is probably going to give us uh, far more transactions. So when you think of any stories, you know, overall from the centralization or decentralization perspective, have you seen anything where you have seen any sort of financial or supply chain? Yeah, you know, I, I guess, Sam, what I think I could add here and, you know, we could probably take into a whole discussion on its own is really a challenge that manufacturers, so in my world, again, equipment manufacturers, aftermarket parts organizations historically have sold through dealerships, okay? And, you know, there was a centralized manufacturer who sold to the dealers and the dealers worked with the customers and uh, serviced the equipment, sold the aftermarket parts uh, and sold the new equipment through their dealerships. Now, with the advent of self-service, right? And uh, e-commerce opportunities, 
it's very challenging for manufacturers and dealers to come together on what is the right way to go to market. Uh, certainly, if manufacturers leave it up to all of their dealers to handle uh, the self-service aspect, you have to think about territories uh, and, and rules and, and uh, the areas in which they get to do business. And then how will one dealership uh, service that self-service as compared to another dealership? You know, you have different sizes. Uh, sometimes you have these mom and pop dealerships, really local and rural areas, and then you have the larger dealerships. So um, the, their ability to invest in these types of tools is very different as well. So I think when we think about centralization, uh, you know, I, there is a current phenomenon happening that manufacturers and dealers have to work through. And that is how what is the best go to market strategy for that order entry process? Uh, should it be a manufacturer's e-commerce site, one where the dealers still have all stocking locations, so they're still buying stock from the manufacturer, but you're giving visibility through that central e-commerce site so that customers can see what's um, available in locations all around, so you're leveraging that dealer, dealer inventory? Or is this something now that uh, manufacturers should take control of? They manage the warehousing as well. So maybe they uh, have their current central warehouse, but they strategically put warehouses and in, in locations to speed to delivery and to market and leverage their dealerships for that real customer on hand experience when they need the service, when they want to take the product for a ride, they want to touch and feel, right? So I think uh, as we think about centralization and decentralization, there is this uh, we call it the dealer dilemma in my world, right, is how are manufacturers having these conversations? Certainly in retail uh, and wholesale and distribution, they've solved for some of these things, but it's still a, a real current uh, challenge for many of the manufacturers that I work with. And they're, they're treading this lightly because they don't want to disrupt their dealer relationships. They have this long history of building their business with these dealer partnerships. So I think that's just something different to add to this conversation and certainly a story I'm seeing it all around. Okay, amazing insights there. And when you mentioned the the word dilemma, you know, when we look at the system from the system implementation perspective, obviously from business perspective, you are going to have a lot of different uncertainty, a lot of different processes that you might be able to implement. But when you are looking at the architecture and the system implementation, you need to make your mind, <laughs> okay, whatever you want to do. So when you are thinking of making mind and let's say, re-architecting the system, let's say if you're working with a customer, what would be your advice in terms of designing the centralized system versus decentralized? So let's say in this scenario, if you're working with a manufacturer, let's say they were centralized or decentralized, and you are trying to provide some best practices, what would be your advice to them? Yeah, t typically the advice, and certainly the trend is to move to one operational system. So if we, you know, go back to Tom's, I really like the way he he d described, you know, you're centralizing on a system and then you have your operations that are, are slightly different. So you're consolidating, I believe, on one ERP system. And my advice would be one e-commerce system that customers use to do business with you. So if the name of your company is XYZ, they're going to XYZ company because that's what they know. And you're going to offer them the best customer experience for all the information that they need. Now, I would tie into your dealer network, bring that information into your centralized structure so that uh, you can still deliver the greatest level of support when it meets uh, when it comes to the delivery side of. It. So that would be uh, and has been our recommendation is give one face to the customer with the option for the dealer experience, but and also the delivery from the multiple locations. Amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Chris, for that. So Tom, I'm actually coming to you, and I will share some experiences from my perspective. So I completely agree with Chris. I mean, see, I am more of a guy. If I am in control, I want to have just one system because my life is going to be so easy, to be honest, okay? I don't want to have multiple systems, but obviously you have to have multiple systems. Let's say if you have the customer-facing e-commerce portal, obviously you don't want to expose your ERP uh, to your consumers, <laughs> okay? So you are going to have multiple systems in general in the architecture. But when you look at the e-commerce footprint in general, when uh, I'm talking to different businesses, especially in the B2C space, 
So Chris's comment was that, you know, you want to have just one e-commerce system. But when I talk to different customers, they are going to have multiple brands. And there is a reason why they have multiple brands. And when they say multiple brands, meaning multiple websites, okay? And they are doing this more from the marketing perspective, from the positioning perspective, because they want to drive traffic for a specific product category. So each of the e-commerce companies may have five different websites. So now in your experience, would you recommend just one website, five websites because marketing is driving it? How would you approach this, Tom? Let's say if you were to advise more from the system architecture strategy. Well, I would advise one because uh, generally speaking, um, the simple architecture, uh, and I, I've already got direct personal experience of this um, at Varian where uh, with Salesforce as the platform, we actually rolled out multiple portals that had a different look and feel to some degree that were customer slash brand specific um, that created that unique user experience, if you will, interacting with uh, that brand, that product line, those features, yet it was still on a single common platform. So I, I think the... The great advances in technologies um, have allowed us to be more and more centralized when it comes to the platforms, the tools and technologies, uh, while still enabling a degree, perhaps a significant degree of uh, what appears to be decentralization from a branding, from a user experience, uh, from a language, from a time zone issue, you know, the, the technologies, and this is actually the thing that uh, Chris made me think about as she was talking about the distributor, or what would you call the dealer dilemma, that technologies are becoming capable, in fact, largely have become capable, not just becoming, have become capable of addressing many of the historically uh, key drivers for decentralization. Again, from a systems point of view, I'm talking about you know, you can develop your systems from a multi-language point of view. Uh, and again, I'm talking customer facing. You can drive outputs uh, in terms of invoices or quotations or other document types that are pulling in the legal jargon, the local language, the T's and C's that are needed for each local market, yet it's still one central system. And, and so... One of the things that, that, as Chris was talking, I was thinking, gee, you know, technology is is not only enabling this, but it is probably undermining any businesses, as as Chris was describing, that are really fundamentally or for for a long period of time have operated based on a decentralized model, because centralization is becoming easier and easier with the capabilities that our systems today offer. So uh, I, I hearken back to the, the portal example there, Sam, that you threw out, um, where you might want to have a single portal and a single customer experience for all of the brands in your portfolio, or you might want to have a completely different experience. You know, Clorox doesn't really want their customers to think of the fact that it's Clorox when they're buying their Hidden Valley uh, salad dressing, right? Not, not things that go well together. Clorox bleach and salad dressing. So let's like keep that as separate as possible. Um, and the users will never know when they log in, you know, maybe to place an order or just to look at, at the site. Um, so I can see the rationale for keeping things separate in some cases, very separate. Um, and I think the single uh, technology platforms now enable that uh, far more easily than they ever did before. Uh, Okay, so just to be clear, uh, you know, so that my listeners are able to follow along. So let's say if I am in the ERP business as well as in the burger business that I'm trying to combine together, obviously it's not a very smart idea to put them together, <laughs> unless you are Sarah Scudder, I guess, <laughs> who can create burger ERP or ERP burger. But <laughs> in in my case, let's say if I have the burger business as well as my, my ERP business, I want to have two brands, but from the platform perspective, you are saying that the e-commerce platform is going to, uh, you know, source my burger business. E-commerce platform is going to source my ERP business as well as I could have my POS as well. So all of these channels could be separate, but the order entry is going to flow through the same system, whether it is e-commerce or ERP. Am I reading this right, Tom? Uh, yes, I think there's always a limit to what can be done sensibly 
on a single common platform. I know, uh, but, but that, that limit is getting further and further out there. Um, a colleague of mine who was a CIO over at Anheuser-Busch, and they, I think, are the owners of the Cardinal baseball team, uh, some uh, amusement parks, as well as beer, were running all of that on SAP. Um, you know, those are pretty different business models, beer, amusement parks, baseball, but yet it was being done. Um, you know, so even that is possible. Um, so I, I think, you know, yeah, we are getting to the point where, um, again, the devil's in the detail. You, you have to really configure these systems to be able to handle very, very different models in that example. Um, but, you know, it is, it is possible. Um, and obviously, then that facilitates a lot of the back end processing, uh, certainly from a financial point of view, uh, streamlining and accelerating uh, and simplifying. So um, that, that was one example that I came across. And, and even I, I worked as a consultant at Clorox for a number of years. And, you know, they had many different products from motor oils to bleaches to salad dressings to other things. And those were fairly different models of distribution and, and obviously completely different customer bases. Um, and uh, yet they still ran it all on a single platform. So, um, yeah, I, I think the issues are not so much the technology anymore um, in terms of limitations. It's really uh, the what you want your operating model to be. And, and, and can you keep it as decentralized or fragmented, such as with dealerships, uh, as, as it once was, given the, the, the globalization or centralization of things like customer portals, where you can't really steer the customer as effectively, maybe to a, a very local operation or part of Amazing. Thank you so much, Tom, for that. So the only thing we can take right now is going to be closing advice. Chris, what would be your closing advice, please? Yeah, I don't agree with Tom. So, hey, Tom, let me just tell you about branding on sites. And, you know, really, we do a lot of things with ERP to make our life better, but we don't make the customer's life easier. And I think you've got it a little backwards. And operations is important, but I think the customer experience in that context is going to overrule. Because I think as, as I give advice to owners, think about that. Don't just focus on internally. Make sure you take the customer's perspective. And in this one story, we gave a major retail grocery store their own b2b website all branded all personal they buy 20 percent more for this guy he didn't see that coming but again that's how much value is in the customer experience and so again as you hear this decentralized centralized you're looking for efficiencies you're looking for synergies training is important consistency is important but again don't forget the customer experience i'll stop there thank you yeah could not agree more thank you so much chris for that uh, abu what is going to be your closing advice uh i think i'm just going to add on a little bit what tom said i think what he meant was you know there are these platforms available which where you can run 10 websites on the same platform, right? So you have Adobe, for example, where you can have 10 different websites, but the engine is the same. So if you're going to feed orders from those 10 different websites, it's just the same engine, right? So you're not building 10 different integrations, uh, for example. Uh, other than that, my suggestion would be, you know, always think of your business first and then design your system and operations to fulfill those. And it can mean very different uh, technical art. Okay, completely agree. Thank you so much, uh, Abu, for that. Uh, Chris, um, what would be your closing advice, please? Yeah, I think I'm just going to repeat some of the things that we've heard here that I think are most important, and that is that there is a trend to centralizing your systems. There's efficiencies gained if, you, if you're running multiple ERPs, if you're running multiple CRMs because you've been a, quite in acquisition mode. Yes, consolidate those. There's, there's definitely value there. There is a lot of value in delivering a great customer experience though. And that's where with the technology today, you can do some really interesting things with IP, uh, depending on where you are in the world, that again, from a central system, you're delivering a great customer experience in Europe that might be very different than what you're getting in the United States, but everything is, is centralized. And that's where I think everybody wins. That's the future in my mind. Love it. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Tom, follow up for Chris's comment and closing advice, please. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree even with the person with whom I disagreed, I guess, uh, Chris, <laughs> um, in that I, I don't think we really fundamentally disagree. And I think Abu kind of nailed it, that it, it's not about uh, putting, you know, internal ops, treating them as more important than, than the customer facing experience and relationship. Um, it, it was it, my, my point was a little bit more about trying to achieve both simultaneously and not, not being forced to choose. So, but, but I also, I, I kind of agree. And my final comment would be in terms of what Abu said about, and maybe even Chris, you know, about focusing on process. I think process and operations 
uh, are the key decisions. Systems come later, and, and the systems are so good now, I think you can centralize much, if not all, of the systems, even with a fairly decentralized business model. So I'd say start with your business and process model, uh, and then worry about uh, the systems which I think is exactly maybe what Chris was saying, right? <laughs> We're on the same page, guys. <laughs> could, could not agree more. Thank you so much, Tom. So that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one topic related to digital transformation, and we always have an expert panel that is willing to share their insights and wisdom. So make sure you guys are going to be here next week. We are going to be here with another topic. Uh, on that note, thank you so much, everybody, for your time and insights tonight. Goodbye, everybody. Thank nice you. seeing you all again. Bye-bye. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Chris Garadini, head over to turnkeytech.com. It's T-U-R-N-K-E-Y-T-E-C.com. If you want to learn more about Christina Harrington, head over to janalpha.com. It's G-E-N-A-L-P-H-A.com. If you want to learn more about Tom Rodden, Follow and connect with him on LinkedIn. If you want to learn more about Abu Asaf, head over to pennymanagement.com. It's P-A-N-N-I-M-A-N-A-G-E-M-E-N-T.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Jason Greenwood, who discusses the nuances of the click and collect process and why you need centralized inventory and distribution strategy to enable this experience. Also the interview with Rick Watson who shares how to plan for warehouse and logistics architecture for DTC brands selling through marketplaces. Also don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.